We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. It's obvious you're not some dumb schmuck up here to snatch a few purses, am I right? You're very perceptive. I watch 60 Minutes. I say to myself, these guys are professional, they're motivated, they're happening, i.e., they want something, huh? Now, personally, I couldn't care less about your politics. Maybe you're pissed off at the camel jockeys, maybe it's the Hebes, Northern Ireland. It's none of my business. I figure you're here to negotiate. Am I right? You're amazing. You figured this all out already. <laughs> hey, business is business. You use a gun, I use a fountain pen. What's the difference? Let's put it in my terms. You're here in a hostile takeover. You grab us for some green mail, but you didn't expect some poison pill was going to be running around in the building. Am I right? Hans... Bobby, I'm your white knight. I must have missed 60 minutes. Secrets and Spies present Espresso Martini. Hello everybody, it is Chris and Matt here. Welcome back to our second episode of Espresso Martini, where we kind of look at the, the sort of spy stories, geopolitics, and other exciting stories. So Matt, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me back. Oh, it's great to have you on. So, um... Well, October, which is the month we'll be looking at, was a very busy month. So busy that I emailed Matt halfway through saying maybe we should... <laughs> <laughs> this episode earlier but we're, we're sticking to one a month for now but we might expand next year but uh it has been a very busy month from the especially from an espionage point of view um and a bit of misinformation and all that other exciting stuff so we will start with probably the biggest story of the end of october arguably was elon musk taking over twitter he finally completed his deal and it has basically, I suppose it's, it's just caused a huge amount of concern because Elon Musk stated before before the purchase of Twitter that he wanted to restore Donald Trump, who'd been banned from the platform. And as of this recording, I don't think he has as of yet. Um, and he has a very kind of... Um, well, what is described as a libertarian point of view with regards to free speech, where pretty much anything goes with very little consequence. And so having somebody with that kind of mentality running uh, uh, you know, Twitter, the most famous and arguably most popular social media platform online at the moment, where you can literally say pretty much anything you want, it didn't bode well. So... <laughs> So, um, Matt, I know you had quite a bit you wanted to say about this, so I'll let you kick off with your your thoughts, and then and then I'll, I'll probably come back. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, as you said, at the time that we are recording this, uh, he's been in control of Twitter for almost a week. I think mm. the deal finalized uh, late last week. Mm. Um, he has uh, dismissed the board, appointed himself the sole member of the board of directors, dismissed the CEO, head of like legal policy. Sounds a bit like the death of Stalin, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a, a bit. Yeah, that's sort of what it feels like yeah. over there. Um, and yeah, to your point that, you know, when the news was announced that he was a serious contender for buying it and then, you know, it came through that 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 the deal was going to go through. Um, there are questions if he would let Donald Trump back on or any of the number of odious characters across the world who have been banned from the platform um, over the years. Uh, one of the th initial points that he made to prospective advertisers on the platform right after he finalized control was that um, as of yet, and this is true as of now as we're recording, um, there haven't been any major changes to Twitter's moderation policy, and he would appoint – essentially a board mm. of people to 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 oversee uh who gets banned who gets brought back on sort of what content is allowed you know who will be on that board uh is sort of the million dollar question um but that's that's uh his stance right now i don't know i mean curious to hear your thoughts on this but when the Deal was announced. I mean, this has been in the works for a while. It was in the summer, yeah, yeah right. That he, yeah, yeah 
because he 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 um because he was he was trying to back out of it at one point, but then some people speculated he was doing that to try and lower the price or something, in some weird kind of Machiavellian forty chess kind of business move. But um, I don't right. know if it quite worked out that way in the end, did it? <laughs> well, he sort of the the stock price was sort of juiced for a bit because I mm. believe at the time that he and Twitter inked the deal, the stock price was around forty billion dollars for the company that he was going to have to come up with and pay, and mm. then. As of closing, for a myriad of reasons that are over the heads of either of us, we're not economists. The stock price is around ten billion, so he grossly overpaid for the company, mm. and right, and has to fill in this chunk of debt now that he has with him and his uh, group of investors, a few of which aren't really good, and we can get into that in a second. Um, but yeah, my my thoughts when the deal was announced. I mean, there was much, uh, as I'm sure you'll remember, much pearl clutching and retiring mm. to one's fainting couches um <laughs> over the thought of of like it. what that would mean you know what a what a uh elon musk reign over twitter would would mean and i wasn't so i mean i'm not a f- i'm personally not a fan of mm. musk i think he's i think spacex has and continues to do amazing work i think the way tesla mm. has revolutionized the electric car industry is is great you know and we might get into this in a bit but his project starlink has done a lot of good in yeah. ukraine yeah um but him personally and the sort of turn he's taken in in recent years i'm not personally a fan of i mean my, my thoughts when i heard it announced I, I it was sort of like a wait and see thing i mean i think if you look at i think a lot of people were very concerned what would happen to the platform if it was essentially a free-for-all hellscape which is, I think is the term that Musk himself used in his message to advertisers. And for me, I thought, you know, there are a myriad of places online right now, platforms online, where the far right, racist, misogynists, neo-Nazis can sort of congregate mm. and say whatever they want. You know, you have Parler, True Social, Gab, Rumble, Getter. Uh, there's, you know, 4chan, 8 Coon, I think it's called now, a myriad of telegram Mm. channels, you know, where it is sort of like the Wild West. It Mm. is a free for all. Mm. And they're miserable there because what they don't want is they don't want to gather amongst themselves Mm. and sort of talk politely. They want to be in what they see as the public square so they can scream at and harass everyone else, you know? And so that's why, you know, whether or not they would have access to Twitter is such a thorn in their, you know, Crawl, I guess. Mm. So my 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 thought was that if if Musk sort of opened the floodgates and let everyone back on, I mean, the rest of us would would leave, mm. and the platform would sort of just wither and die. And in that absence, you know, either someone else will come along with a lot of capital and prestige and make a new platform to replace Twitter, yeah. or the world would go back to the way it was when Twitter didn't exist, which was arguably kind of better. <laughs> <laughs> in many ways, yes. <laughs> Gosh, back in those days, you know. <laughs> yeah, remember that? <laughs> yeah, like skipping through fields and all that, you know. <laughs> the late 2000s? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I'm like, okay, so either there'll be a new platform where there aren't Nazis screaming at you all the time, or it'll just go away, you know, and and we will endure. Mm. Well, we've got the metaverse to look forward to, haven't we? So we're going to be able to oh, see yeah, Nazis well, they got- screaming at us soon. <laughs> Pretty soon you'll have legs in the metaverse, yeah. too. Yeah. I don't know if you're excited for that. Oh, I man. sure am. That's yeah. sarcasm, if you can't catch that. The Interpol now have a metaverse <laughs> headquarters, I saw. <laughs> so is somebody's taking it seriously. <laughs> <That's not true. laughs> anyway. Yeah. <laughs> But that that was basically my and and still sort of remains my thoughts yeah. on Moss Taker of Twitter. I don't like him personally, but it's sort of a wait and see. I mean, his uh, his reposting of conspiracy theories about the assassination attempt on oh, Nancy yeah. Pelosi's husband did not inspire confidence at no, all. No, um, but. Yeah, what did what did what did you think about it? Yeah, well, back on on the point of sharing the the conspiracy theory about Nancy Pelosi. I mean, uh, I, I've so um, I've got an interview coming out. So as um, when this recording goes out on Saturday, there'll be a recording with an, an interview with David Nywert that precedes this episode, um, and we discussed a little bit about this um, and the the Nancy Pelosi story. The sharing that conspiracy theory is just insane. I mean. 
I just don't yeah. understand how an intelligent person, because Elon Musk is is not a stupid man. He he can't be a stupid man no. to have achieved what he's achieved. Yet somehow he is un he sort of is unable to discern quality information or even um, accurate information online. I mean, he was quoting some random website that I've never even heard of before prior to it. The Santa Monica Observer. It's yeah. like a fake, it's a what fake sort yeah. of made up. Yeah. It's, it, it's not a real newspaper. No, exactly. So why, it's a bit like um, a website called Neon Nettle, was not it? <laughs> There's some random website where there's a guy who um, calls himself Tyler Durden who, who publishes all sorts of nonsense. And uh, remember years ago, some friend of mine sort of said, oh, it's official, something, you know, N- Neil Nestle have said this and it meant that. And I'm like, that's just complete nonsense. What do you want? You know, yeah. how are people sourcing stuff? Um, so if, if the head of Twitter, Elon Musk, cannot source information properly, it really does not bode well. Obviously, the day-to-day operation will... I doubt he will be overseeing it. He will be hiring people and hopefully intelligent people to oversee the nitty gritty of the day to day operations of Twitter and its moderation. But what worries me um, is what I was saying earlier about this sort of libertarian attitude. Then he's not alone in this. Most technology people seem to have this sort of libertarian bent where they feel like all voices are valid all you know all opinions should be shared and you know it's up to the the user to figure out what they do and don't want to believe and i i just think that's dangerous um it's not good at all and in fact there's a really good article which i linked to written by a journalist called dave troy who writes at the atlantic and it's titled no elon and jack are not competitors they're collaborating so as you were saying there's this sort of been this story of um jack the guy who who was one of the founders of twitter might be setting up his own new version of twitter um but it's i think it's called blue sky or something but it's not necessarily going to be be the be all and end all if anything that elon and jack are not necessarily competitors so people should be a bit careful about whatever next platform they go to because it might just end up being the same sort of thing but what was interesting in that article was this discussion about this ideology that motivates musk jack and also Vladimir Putin, <laughs> our favourite person at the moment. Um, and what was interesting is that Elon Musk has this belief that democracy needs to be managed, and it's a belief that converges with Putin. Um, and there's this sort of this weird view in technology, and I've got a few friends in tech, and I don't mean this personally, but sometimes I do. They do say things, and, and I'm like, really. And one of the things that they, my friends, believe, and Musk seems to believe, is that they have this sort of anti-government stance, and they seem to think that we don't really need governments; we just need an app where citizens can just vote on every matter, and v- voter turnout is already low. Also, voters, I don't mean this to be rude, but statistically, recently, like with Brexit, for example, when Brexit happened, the next day, the first thing everybody was Googling was, what does Brexit mean? So a lot of voters are not very well informed. And and you think that people are going to use an app just to vote for this, that, and other issues? People get people like it probably for the first week or so. And then you also get like these... Um, these nutcases who go online and post fake reviews to kind of to trash a show they don't like. So you can imagine how suddenly it's going to get out of control. And what about a national security crisis? I don't know. That Russia's just launched the nukes. Is is Elon Musk um, going to put out a tweet or whatever for us to vote on? Should we fire back? Should we not? Should we do this? Should we? Do that? It, it won't. You know, it's unmanageable. It's a really stupid idea. Yeah. But there seems to be this sort of constant thing with technology people they seem to think that technology will solve everything when in fact like i think can't remember who observed this but twitter is not a technology problem it's a people problem and ultimately you know we need to fix ourselves first before we can really ever hope to properly fix our our online spaces and technology alone is not going to fix it you're not going to kind of tech your way out of hatred um you might be able to kind of uh curb its reach um but we we've, we've seen like with the internet in the last 20 years the way that like extremists can now just unite with each other when before they would have to subscribe to a pamphlet or a newspaper when now they could just log on on their computer and talk to yeah. god knows who and david yeah. david and who i was talking to was telling me about how um quite a few extremists um and former extremists that he's interviewed 
a lot of them were radicalized by going down a kind of algorithm rabbit hole on YouTube. And Dylan Roof in particular, he went down the rabbit hole of algorithms on, on YouTube. And these algorithms are designed to keep users, you know, there's something particularly new, but it's designed to keep users on that platform. And if the algorithms are sending you towards all sorts of nonsense and um, and you're slowly kind of getting sucked in on it, it's not good for your mental health or, or anybody's physical health afterwards. And um, with the attacker who, who or the, uh, the attempted assassination of Nancy Pelosi, that individual, so his name escapes me at the moment, um, he was... His last name is DePape. DePape, that's it. Is it Peter DePape or Pete DePape? I think I think yeah. that might be correct. I know yeah. the last one is definitely to pay. Yeah, but. yeah. So he he was inspired by all sorts of online nonsense, and a bit like the it reminds me it reminded me a little bit of the PizzaGate shooting where that guy went in with an assault rifle to some random pizza shop in was it Washington and fired in the air in the hope that he would somehow liberate yeah. children who were locked up by uh, Hillary Clinton and her pedophile cabal, you know. <laughs> It's it's sort of laughable, but at the same time, it's not because it's so serious because people are believing this stuff. And, and, you know, I was a former conspiracy theorist myself back in the early 2000s. I believed a lot of nonsense and I had friends and I I still have. Well, uh, there are former friends of mine who still believe in that nonsense. Um, And unfortunately, they've become a lost cause. And I feel really sorry for I feel very conflicted because the the people I once knew, um, and I and one particular individual I knew before he went down the rabbit hole conspiracism is just completely lost, and it and, I, and it's a real open wound for me personally because I've lost a friend to it, and um, and I feel very conflicted. I feel kind of bad because in a way I've had to, for my own health, had to cut him out of my life, um, and it and it's not easy that, um, and I think all of us at some point have either got a family member or a friend who have gone completely down the conspiracies rabbit hole and it all unfortunately stems from something on the internet they've seen and and like the yeah. you know the early days of online conspiracism it was people like alex jones who who um is currently getting sued for nearly a billion dollars <laughs> and good yeah good <laughs> <laughs> you know finally finally so but i got what's get worried me about alex jones or what shocked me and and disturbed me he he was making an awful lot of money i think he was making something like 26 million a year or something in that region and it's like how on earth is somebody like that making that much money it is unbelievable and it just just does not bode it's well for lies too yeah, just yeah. nonsense yeah and it just Complete doesn't bode nonsense. Well. It just doesn't bode well for yeah. humanity's future. It really is quite worrying. So, <laughs> it's, yeah. so those are my um, kind of thoughts or rants about Elon Musk and the internet. But yeah. <laughs> I think mm. this is definitely true. Seems to be true with the men who attacked yeah. Nancy Pelosi's yeah. husband, and you know a lot of these other characters that you see in in recent years, mostly on the far right, who have committed these attacks, like the man who shot up a uh, supermarket in Buffalo. New York in a predominantly African American neighborhood sort of documented that these people were sort of just like to your point fell down this internet rabbit hole often during during COVID during yeah, lockdown and that yeah. isolation oh, you yeah. know where they just get and it's yeah it's it's I'm lucky I don't have anyone in my sort of immediate inner circle mm-hmm. family or friends mm-hmm. who've gone down that way thankfully um, but yeah it's sort of it's like it's like losing someone to a cult it it yeah it's that's exactly what it is it's it, it's losing someone to a cult it's exactly what it is you know are they living out in a compound in the yeah, desert somewhere yeah. waiting for a comet no but it's the same thing you know um and to your point about you know these tech billionaires these tech bros like musk or, or jack dorsey it's a kind of to me it's a kind of techno neoliberalism mm, you know mm. where you know, neoliberalism, like capitalism, the free market will sort of solve everything. It's the same sort of idea that that I don't know if it's so much that at the heart of their beliefs, if you really analyze this, if it's the thought that tech will solve everything, it's the thought that their personal brilliance mm. can solve everything. You know, like I'm really good at making an electric car or putting a rocket in space. Therefore, my genius can solve all of humanity's issues no matter what it is, you know? And that's where you see people like Musk or another uh, venture capitalist, David Sachs, who is one of Musk's investors on this Twitter deal, you know, recently putting out these hypothetical peace deals 
um, oh, yeah. that well, they're trying yeah. to broker between <laughs> Russia and Ukraine, which yeah. is stuff like you think no one's thought of this before. It's to me, it's like these guys trying to to negotiate with Putin. It's it's like that scene in Die Hard where the guy went in one of yes. Holly's co-workers yeah. goes into the office with Ellis, Hans Gruber Ellis, and it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He's like, you know. Yeah, let's solve this. You know, this is nothing. We can do this over lunch. And then he gets shot in the face. It's the same kind of arrogance. Um, you know, it's, 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 but there's this weird thing that they do where it's like Jack Dorsey, I think, probably personally has more sense in this point at Elon Musk if we're going to compare the two. But I mean, I think a lot of Twitter's problems, a lot of the problems that you see in social media today are just sort of because of his in action, you know, mm. like this, this illusion of complexity that tech bros create around problems to absolve themselves of personal responsibility, you know, like, oh, I have to go on a month long vision quest in the desert to decide <laughs> if having neo-Nazis on my site yeah. is bad or not. Yeah. You know, at the same point, there's this illusion of simplicity, like the Russia Ukraine war mm. that they create around issues that they feel can can highlight what they see as their brilliance yeah. you know oh i think this is really simple mm. so let's mm. just solve this thing that no one else is able to solve right now you know what i mean yeah, or or I or they're so sort of simplified in their thinking there's one other thing i've noticed so like elon musk said at the beginning of this week i think he was going to charge 20 dollars for a blue tick and then had a, a bit of an altercation with um uh stephen king stephen king is a and, yeah and then it changed to eight dollars a month and this is a very tech thing i've noticed a lot of tech people kind of bodge their way through stuff rather than just sitting down actually thinking it through properly before releasing yeah. it onto the public they kind of fix as they go along and do this sort of open beta testing and stuff so do they think that they can fix the ukraine war with this sort of um open bodging their way through approach is ridiculous and yeah, 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 yeah. And the Starlink thing. Um, I, I'm glad you mentioned that earlier because there was something really interesting came up about this. So Elon Musk has sort of been implying that he's graciously let the Ukrainians use Starlink pretty much free of charge. Yet it's transpired from quite a few people on the ground in Ukraine that I follow on Twitter that every single individual's had to buy the hardware themselves and pay a subscription. So I'm like, well, who who's actually getting the free Starlink then? I'm not quite sure. Right. Is it isolated cases? It's a bit unclear, but quite a few people on the front line in Ukraine have, have right. busted this sort of myth that Elon Musk is somehow graciously giving away Starlink for free. Uh, so, But then at the same time, he has the power to shut it down, which is one of the dangers of then private individuals who are in charge of global communication and infrastructure if we put it that way there is a danger that if that individual falls out of favor with something of a country that he could just shut it down and that's that's wrong um and and so in the end what's happening in ukraine is a very um is a very hard winter coming and um, from uh, from an interview i did just earlier this week apparently one of the advantages that the ukrainians have had so far is obviously with drones and surveillance but now these cloud cloud covers coming in it's going to make that harder and if they lose the internet as well as losing the capability of drones and obviously putin's bombing the crap out of all their power and infrastructure it makes it all the advantages that the Ukrainians kind of once had are slowly eroding. And so um, Musk removing the Internet is one of those advantages that he will be removing. And there is no other at this time. I don't think there's any other real technology that can do what Starlink does, because the only other alternative and this is what they do on films is they get a van that kind of has a major 3G or 5G connection that then creates a little local Wi-Fi um, via the phone network. And honestly, that's not really going to happen in Ukraine. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a very interesting problem. Uh, and it's very James Bond villainy. You know, it's like Moonraker is becoming, slowly turning into a documentary. <laughs> yeah, really. Get, every year we get yeah, closer. Or, 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 or Tomorrow Never Dies. Yeah. You know? Yeah, which is, I guess, better and better the more I watch that film now. It's like, oh my goodness, you know, yeah. they weren't far yeah. off. <laughs> Well, some of the some of the uh, backstory on the Starlink mm. issue, if if listeners are unfamiliar, so Musk sort of allowed or supposedly mm. allows 
access to his Starlink system in Ukraine for free and has been for several months since at least shortly, I believe, after the war began, um, which has been, you know, this this lifeline for people to to reach outside the country. Um, and then a few months ago, was it, uh, yeah. said that he wouldn't allow yeah. use for Starlink inside Crimea, which, of course, has been occupied by the Russians and claimed as Russian territory since 2014. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because he believed that, you know, that would instigate Putin into starting a nuclear war. So we have to appease Putin so we don't get a nuclear war is basically his point. And then, uh, more recently, was it the Ukrainian foreign minister basically sort of told him off for that point? Mm. And then shortly thereafter, Musk came out with an announcement that said he wasn't going to provide Starlink services in Ukraine for free. Mm. And essentially the Pentagon was going to have to pick up the bill mm. If if they if they wanted this service to continue, which I mean, if I'm being perfectly honest, SpaceX is a U.S. defense contractor. Yeah. You know, yeah. pretty much most of its income is sourced. So the government are probably already footing the bill, aren't they? Right. <laughs> yeah. Most of their income is sourced from the Pentagon anyway. So mm. does he have a point that he that SpaceX should be compensated for their services just in the same way that, you know, Lockheed Martin or someone else would? Yes. But I mean, I think to me, it's sort of how he went about it. It's that, oh, you know, the Ukrainian foreign minister said something I don't like, or I was passed information by Russians with access to Putin that made me sympathetic to his mm. worldview, you know, therefore, I'm going to radically change my company's policy. I mean, that's an issue. I mean, he said stuff in the past that Taiwan should be a special administrative region, the same way that Hong Kong is to mainland China, which is essentially just parroting the Chinese Communist Party's talking points, yeah. you know, yeah. which if you if you look at someone who's at the head of a major defense contractor like SpaceX is and is now in charge of this critical public communications utility, you know, uh, yeah, that brings up legitimate security concerns. I mean, I don't know if this will go through, but there was talk that the DOJ would put it up to sort of a national security review. Mm. You know, like, is he best suited to be in charge of this company? You know, and like you look at his in the article that we were talking about earlier, the Dave Troy article talks about how Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey both sort of see their vision for Twitter as being a public good or can be used as a at a reimagined at a protocol level, sort of like a in the same way that cryptocurrency is managed. You know, and then not just a private company, but then using this sort of restructured Twitter for the good of humanity, right? Then you look at one of his, I think the second largest investor in Twitter now that Musk controls it is the uh, Saudi Kingdom Holding Company, you know, run by Prince Al-Walid bin Talal, Saudi billionaire. Kingdom Holdings is, it's not a sovereign wealth fund, but it's a, it's a private Saudi company. But still, I mean, the idea that you can operate that size of a company in Saudi Arabia without the blessing of Mohammed bin Salman and the royal family mm. is kind of ridiculous, yeah. you know? So you think, okay, so Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey say they want to use Twitter for the good of humanity. Mm. Do you think the Saudis are interested in using Twitter for the good of mm. humanity or yeah. for the good of themselves? Yeah. Do you think the Russians are interested in using Twitter for the good of humanity or the good of themselves? Mm. And that's the concern with someone like Elon Musk at the head of Twitter. And I mean, up until he reposted the conspiracy theories about the attack on Pelosi's husband, I was willing to sort of chill and yeah. give him the benefit of the doubt yeah. and see what he does. But that to me was very concerning. Someone did get to him and convince him to delete it, which is better than it still being there. But yeah. the man yeah. of that age yeah. and that net worth and that much power mm. should know better. Definitely. And he denied he posted it as well which is even worse. Yeah, like this weird Trumpian thing, like, no, I didn't. Like, we all saw you, yeah, dude. and then people sent him screen grabs of it, and, and like, uh -huh. yeah, it was Trumpian. It is very Trumpian, this whole, you know, um, yeah, it's just, I, yeah, it's just the best way to describe it, really. That approach is very Trumpian, <laughs> and it's it just does not bode well at all. Um, and it, like you were saying, we were, we were giving him the benefit of the doubt, hoping he'd rise to the occasion. It kind of reminds me of when Trump came to power. Everybody was yeah. saying, he'll probably rise to the occasion of the yeah. office, you know. and That the office, yeah. yeah, never happened. No, 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 indeed, indeed. We'll see. I mean, I mm. honestly, I think if, look, advertisers do not want to be on a platform 
that is flooded with neo-Nazis and people posting the N-word dozens of times in all caps. You know, like, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just ask Kanye West. As, <laughs> like, right. Yeah. It's not right. Look mm. what happened to Kanye West. Mm. That's not going to happen. You know, so if if he allows Twitter to become that kind of a place, it's going to wither and die. People who aren't neo-Nazis or Russian trolls are going to leave. Advertisers are going to leave. And the platform's going to die. And he'll lose a lot of money. He'll lose a lot of money. His investors will lose a lot of money. And in that absence, I mean, I don't think it's going to be Jack Dorsey with this blue sky thing or whatever it's called. But someone else will come along to meet that need in the market and create basically a replacement that people want to use. So it's just how long and how much agony does everyone have to go through? Twitter is obviously a very powerful information tool. Mm -hmm. And they have been doing a slightly better job in the recent months of at least blocking Russian trolls and so on. But again, is that if Elon Musk is sympathetic to Putin, or is he if he's even compromised by Putin, uh, who knows? That's a wild speculation i've seen that online but i i've not seen anything substantial to say that he is compromised by putin there's no pp tape that i'm aware of but uh but that you know right but uh anyway but um if he were does that mean that suddenly russian misinformation and even other foreign misinformation because it's not just the russians who do it, it is gonna flood twitter you know it's, it's an interesting sure one well yeah you have a company mm. with direct ties into the Saudi royal family, the second largest investor. You have a man in charge of it who I don't I don't think is 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 I wouldn't use the word compromised by Putin, but for reasons that are his own, at least allows himself to be taken in by narratives that are sympathetic to Putin. That's a polite way of saying it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it runs this uh, electric car company that does a lot of business in China. And if Tesla wants to do business in China, mm. Musk is going to have to let the Chinese do what they want with Twitter, mm. you know? Mm. And it's a private company. So it's, it's, I was, it's, it's a private company. So it's not even like he can say, oh, well, the shareholders, there mm. are no shareholders. It's him. Mm. Mm. No, definitely. And I'm assuming components for his cars, like, uh, batteries and minerals and so on probably have some connection to China and some other countries as well. Of course, so there's, there's certainly whole definitely supply a, chain. Yeah, so it's definitely a business. Um, what's the term we want there? Uh, conflict of interest. That's the term we want. Yes. <laughs> so that's yeah. There's definitely a potential for that. So it's yeah. It is. It is concerning. Um, you know, it's it's yeah. It's one of many because obviously you know it's corporate ownership of other media spaces that are equally concerning. But this is definitely one of the newer concerns that we all share at the moment. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add or, or are you happy? No, I think I done quite well. Got it all out. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, um, we'll just have a quick look at a bit of espionage because um, frankly there's been an awful lot of espionage has been going on in the last month. <laughs> <laughs> so a quick look might be a bit of a misnomer there. But, um, so there was a, there's been a few interesting things come up and as I skim through, so the one that, the one that really jumped out at me um so the the so there's a, a sub stack i read by john schindler so john schindler's former nsa um he has a sub stack where he shares various little spy stories that catch his eye uh, and occasionally he does catch some interesting ones um but the one that struck me a little bit was this really interesting story about these two doctors who believe they were going to sell secrets to the russians so i say they believe they're going to sell secrets because it turned out to be an fbi sting operation but there were these two doctors one major jamie lee henry who worked at fort bragg with classified clearance and a second doctor her wife anna gabrielen i hope i got that name right who works at john hopkins university hospital in baltimore they were both arrested for attempting to sell secrets to russia and they were trying to sell medical secrets of u.s personnel basically it's all these medical files about various ailments um I guess everything from ptsd to other things that could be used to compromise people um especially down the line and what struck me a little bit on this one so with uh major jamie lee henry so she was the first one of the first trans american soldiers and what blew my mind a little bit was the fact that that um that then she wanted as a member of the lgbtq plus community that she would then want to go and 
willingly work for Russia that has an absolutely appalling domestic record with the LGBTQ plus community. I mean, I've heard stories of groups who try and pose as a, 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 a would be date for a gay man only to then to then go and beat the crap out of them. And the police turn a blind eyes, that kind of thing. And there's other stories far worse than that. But that's quite routine in Russia. And I was just amazed that this individual then, you know, didn't just want to sell secrets to Russia, but they said that they actually wanted to join the Red Army. And then Major Henry's wife, Gabriella, and I could, I don't know enough about her. I've been trying to look into her. There's not been enough reporting on her, but I, I can only assume that she's of Russian heritage because she basically said that she was motivated by patriotism towards Russia and wanted to help Russia with the uh, Ukraine war and both and then Henry added to that that she viewed that the Ukraine war was actually just a kind of proxy war for America for their own hatred towards Russia so it's like so Henry strikes me psychologically as a very interesting kind of character I'm trying to work out whether maybe they were a victim of abuse in the American army because of her choices or whether I don't know, or whether they went down the the YouTube rabbit hole like other people and have slowly got sucked in by Russian propaganda to want to go and then work for Russia. It just blew my mind that one. Um, there is another spy story that John mentioned uh, about a guy called David Dork who had the shortest career I've seen at the NSA, where he started on the sixth of June, twenty twenty two, and then resigned on the first of July due to unexplained family illness. And Dork, uh, David Dork had, um, it transpired he had an incredible debt of somewhere in the region of $237,000 and um, about $33,000 of that was in student debt. And he wanted to basically clear his debt. So he went, to, he basically went online and um, reached out to a few people and made contact with somebody he believed working for the Russian government, unknown to him. It was actually an online covert employee, OCE, which is a new acronym for uh, officers of the FBI who work online. Um, and uh, and basically, Dork tried to sell what little access they had to secrets. He had a few documents on him, which he showed as a kind of way to kind of demonstrate his bona fides, his undercover FBI agent, and then tried to rejoin the NSA with the hope to restart his career in spring of next year. And thankfully, the FBI obviously found this guy and, and busted him. But uh, what's an interesting one with that story is there's a you know personal debt being a motivation, and it's a bit like Aldrich Ames, who was in terrible yeah. debt, uh, allegedly because of his um, then wife's expensive taste. But uh, it's a bit unfair to just blame his wife for that. But <laughs> certainly that's the um, the popular view about Aldrich Ames and how he got into terrible debt. But um, you know it's a very interesting one, and with the cost of living crisis that we've got in the UK, and I'm sure you know you got problems in the states and things, people. Get getting into terrible debt and ending up either in the US security services, it does create a big national security problem. And yeah. so you, one could say the cost of living crisis is a national security concern if you want to. But it, it just struck me as quite interesting. It's not the first time this has happened, and I'm sure it sadly won't be the last. But uh, it certainly felt quite um, on point with all the kind of financial crisis and stuff going on at the moment, and also the debate about uh, President Biden trying to relieve people of certain level of student debt and stuff, which is obviously obviously be met with criticism and praise and more criticism from uh, from his own party as well so so it's an interesting one i don't know if you had any thoughts on any of of those bits i just discussed there. well the interesting thing to me about especially the dark story mm. you know the guy who worked at the nsa for like a week and, mm. then, and then left and immediately contacted yeah. the russians yeah. it's <laughs> it's i don't know i mean someone with that you would think someone with that level of debt would never be able to set foot in the building. Yeah. You know? Like, how did he get to the point where he was even conditionally offered employment? You know, like this is something that NSA's counterintelligence, their mm. security teams, when they when they do these background checks, and the FBI is involved in this too. When you're getting a top security clearance, they know all this stuff, and the fact that that got past them. I mean, yeah. they they the FBI, the NSA knew how much debt this guy was in 
when they let him in the building. Yeah, because there's no way he could have hidden that, is there? Unless he had a Swiss no. account, you know, and it was all... But somebody with that much debt wouldn't, would they? Yeah, yeah no. I, it's just, yeah, how he gets in the building is is really kind of strange to me. I mean, there must have been some uncomfortable conversations at Fort Meade yeah. after that. I mean, thankfully, it was a sting, and he was never actually in communications with any Russian intelligence officers, but... Um, as far as the other ones, the, the couple selling medical information, I've never heard of medical information being sold or, or, or sought by a foreign intelligence service in that way. It makes complete sense why mm. they would want to do it. Mm. I mean, not too long ago, the uh, Chinese intelligence breached the databases of the uh, Office of Personnel Management, OPM, yeah. Yeah. here in the U.S., yeah. which is basically like sort of the general – human resources department mm. for the whole federal mm. government, mm. you know, um, and they got access to that database. And so the personal information of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of us government employees mm. at the federal level were compromised. Um, yeah. But as far as their motivation there, I see no why, you know, a trans military officer would be sympathetic to the Russians, you know, who are infamously anti LGBTQ in any way. Uh, I see no ideological consistency whatsoever. No, no, especially with Ukraine as well. So there've been like soldiers, that, yeah. commanders, like telling their troops this is all about fighting wokeism or something, and it's just like and and fighting yeah. the gays and and it's some awful law where where Putin's trying to kind of equate being gay with pedophilia or something. It's some I can't remember what that law right. is now, but it's some bizarre stuff. It's yeah. Well it's the same it's the same kind of grooming, quote unquote grooming rhetoric that you hear a lot in the right, at least over in, in the US nowadays. Uh I know the Russians in the past had banned a law that they said would sort of prevent mm. gay propaganda from reaching kids in Russia. And just recently they applied it to adults across the board so that to me seems that it would effectively be illegal to at least publicly be transsexual mm. in russia mm. so you know why this army officer would be sympathetic to to them i don't i don't understand it but you know i mean like tom clancy said the thing with fiction is it has to make sense and real life doesn't mm. i think this is one <laughs> yeah, of those true. issues where it doesn't yeah. make sense yeah, I'm sure more information will come out in the trial. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming because I, 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 my, my, um, my speculative spy hat. I'll put that on. If her wife was of, of Russian descent, it did make me wonder because when I was looking at the article, it it kind of felt like she may have initiated contact, and I do wonder mm. whether she might have been pushing this a bit but I, again that's me speculating but it's um but it, it, it i was kind of thinking of um have you seen the film black sunday or the book uh which is based on the thomas harris book i have yeah is that the one where they fly a blimp over the super bowl with a nuke in it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, that, so, um, so my, my, you know how Delia, yeah, is sort of managing the Vietnam veteran and slowly kind of pushing him towards this right. operation. Is right. there something there? Did, did I don't know? I'd love to know a bit more about their relationship and stuff. And at what point in in um, in Major Henry's life that they got together and and so on, and whether Major Henry may have been a victim of of um, abuse in the U.S. military because I think Chelsea Manning had a similar kind of motivation you know with regards to being a victim of abuse and things in the military yeah. so i wonder whether there's something there that may um have sort of instigated some of that but i did again i'm speculating maybe it's one to keep an eye out on because it you know i'm sure some information will come out in the trial um and we'll probably find out more so yeah i'm sure there's there's yeah. a lot more to the story that we're not privy to mm. at the time there there has yeah. to be it just doesn't make sense yeah yeah, and this, and the weird thing is, there's not an awful lot about um, about the the wife. Um, so I do wonder mm -hmm. why that is. There's a lot more about Major Henry than than uh, her wife. So we'll see. We will see. We will see. Um, more Russian news. Uh, so we've had Russian spies were expelled from The Hague back in April and a London-based NGO called the Dossier Centre uh, has revealed the identity of 17 Russian diplomats. And these uh, diplomats, in quotation marks, uh, were actually officers of various Russian intelligence services and they were trying to infiltrate both The Hague and the 
Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the OCPW, who became famous during the investigation into Syrian chemical weapons use and also the downing of flight MH17 in Crimea by Russian-backed forces. And what was interesting about these intelligence officers, so um, so they all had this sort of rather bland cover at the embassy. So one of them was the third secretary of the embassy, and he turned out to be an FSB intelligence officer named Andre Vizaniv, I think I say you pronounce his name, and he was trained in electronic warfare. Then you had Mikhail Malashuk, who was trained in radio electronics, and he was a GRU officer, but undercover as a trade attaché. Then he had another trade attaché who was a former rocket scientist. And then he had two other diplomats who worked for the SVR in counterintelligence. So presumably, they were looking for spies within their own ranks as well. So that's a Really interesting little one there. Um, and that particular NGO is backed by, was financed by Mikhail Khodorovsky, who was the Ru- who was a uh, Russian businessman who openly criticized, yeah, corruption within Russia. And he is the subject of a documentary, which I've still yet to see, called Citizen K. He was the head of Luke Oil. Yeah, ah, is that it? Is that right? Yeah. In the 90s. He was the head of, Lu- yeah, it's uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky. Yeah, he was the head of Luke Oil. It's like the third richest man in Russia at one time. Right, yeah, something? very yeah. big deal in the 90s, early 2000s. Mm. Mm. And then essentially, the story with him is didn't want to play ball with Putin, and he got thrown in prison for it. You know, I think the deal that Putin cut with the oligarchs was, you know, go free and make your billions, but don't cross me politically at home. And also I get half, you know. And Kodakovsky didn't want to play that game, and he he, he paid for it in in another way. Yeah. Yeah, well, now he has his own uh, NGO, which is exposing kind of Kremlin activity. Um, So, yeah, (laughs) so he's he's doing quite well there. We'll just skim over to a bit of Chinese espionage. Um, So one of the – there's been two really big stories in the UK, and and I'm sure they've reverberated in the States too. So the first one – was about these um these so basically in early in October a story broke about the discovery of these Chinese police stations across the US, UK and Europe. The information came out from a Madrid based human rights organization called the Safeguard Defenders. Now officially these offices are supposed to be for Chinese nationals to renew government issued identifications which would normally be done at an embassy, not a police station, um, especially a Chinese police station. Um, and it's also believe, But it's also believed now that these police stations have a more sinister purpose, such as spy, spying on Chinese citizens abroad by the Communist Party and also, um, you know, sort of people from Hong Kong and so on who fled the Chinese Communist Party influence. So it's led to the Irish government has ordered these police stations to be shut. There's been debate in Parliament just this week about it, and they are now working to prevent transnational repression. And uh, the UK are going to step up their efforts now to try and uh, sort this. And and this story, when I was reading it, had echoes of earlier scandals from the 80s and 90s when the Libyan government under Colonel Gaddafi would spy and harass Libyan expats living in the UK. Uh, and also is reminiscent of some of the... Uh, discoveries at the Iraqi embassies during the Gulf War, where they found these sort of torture chambers and interrogation cells in, you know, embassies around the world. So, um, yeah, it's a very interesting one. And with the current leader of the Communist Party, has just got a historic third term, uh, which is unusual because most Chinese leaders are limited to two terms. So it looks like the Chinese Communist Party are quite happy of the way uh, Xi Jinping is running things. And with tensions over Taiwan increasing, this all this isn't boding well. Um, not a lot is boding well this week, but... <laughs> I don't know if you had any thoughts or observations on the Chinese police stations. And also there was a story involving the uh, former RAF pilots who... um Right, who've been alleged to be training Chinese Air Force pilots. But what's interesting about this story, so it's just come out um, the latter part of this month, the Daily Mail reported that, in fact, the MOD had officially been training these pilots in the UK at RAF staff colleges, and RAF pilots were officially sent to China to teach aviation English, all as part of a conservative government scheme that ran from 2016 to 2019. So, yeah. and, and I know this story has sent shockwaves because um, the American Air Force are quite rightly concerned that um, 
you know, recent tactics may have been given to Chinese pilots. Yeah. Um, and especially with the F-35 and, and Britain and America being so closely linked on that plane. Um, so, yeah, so any any thoughts on either of those stories, especially the American reaction to the RAF pilots and stuff? That'd be quite interesting. Well, I mean, to, to touch on these quote-unquote police stations, um, and so they're not I'm, – where I'm, I'm looking at, at two articles right now. Maybe yeah. this will be in the show notes. So the first is a New York Post article – um, and that talks about one specifically in uh, one of these Chinese – It's I mean they're not openly called a police state. Like you said, it's a weird mm-hmm. sort of bureaucratic thing to provide passport renewals and driver's license renewals to Chinese citizens abroad. So this one in the New York Post talks about uh, – it's a nonprofit. The America Chang Li Association owns and operates basically a suite of offices uh, – 107 East Broadway in the Lower East Side, which is sort of just right outside Chinatown in Lower mm. Manhattan. Mm. Um, mm. And but yeah, essentially functions as a law enforcement agency, you know, spying on Chinese diaspora in 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 New York um, and says here that the report accuses these these stations of involvement in forcibly returning more than 200 overseas nationals to China, oh, wow. which, I mean, wow. to me, I don't know the legalese behind it, which seems to me like human trafficking, you know? Like, if you go and find someone who's outside of your country, you know, mm. uh, legally and has not committed any crimes at home, you would then, without their consent and the knowledge of local law enforcement in that country, essentially kidnap mm. them and bring them back against their will. That, to me, again, I'm not a lawyer. Sounds like human trafficking. And this other article in uh, Politico Europe, which talks about the same sort of setup, these Chinese quote-unquote police stations, uh, two in London, one in Hendon and Croydon, one in Glasgow, other ones in uh, Ireland and 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 uh, the Netherlands, um, essentially functioning in, in the same way. Um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, to put it, Bluntly, I think the issue here is, okay, if you think of a police state, which is what modern China is, you know, you would hear the idea that a police state would would spy on dissidents outside of their country. I mean, that's that's a dog bites man story, you know? I mean, yeah, they're going to do it. It's the job of the FBI and MI5 to try and thwart them, you know? Mm-hmm. But they're going to do it. But you think those operations would be conducted, at least legally, are supposed to be conducted by Chinese intelligence officers under diplomatic cover operating outside of their embassies and operating within their embassies and consulates, not sort of a fake pseudo charity organization that's set up in an office building in, you know, Chinatowns all over the world. You know, I mean, that's sort of the issue here that that they that they would sort of establish these things. I mean, the one in New York, the New York Post article talks about the IRS mm-hmm. revoked their tax mm-hmm. exempt status for failing to submit tax filing for three years straight. So it seems like these places were sort of at least on the radar of at least in the U.S. on the FBI's. So it's just interesting to me that they would be allowed to operate as long as they've been allowed to operate. I mean, this has been going on for it seems from the New York Post article at least ten years. The New York Post office was incorporated in 2013. Um, you know, since, since it's, since it's a fake sort of charity set up, there's nothing stopping law enforcement from just, you know, raiding these offices mm. and shut them down, you know, like they don't have diplomatic protection, you know? Yeah. The money laundering concern or something. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's what fake charities usually get done for, isn't it? Yeah. That's, that's a crime under US and European law, you know? Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, if you're also going to play the what about ism thing, I mean, the NYPD operates liaison offices, a couple um, globally. I know there's one in London for sure. I mean, the difference from that is like those are essentially liaison offices in cooperation with local law enforcement mm. in that country. Mm. Yeah. And the They're NYPD. They're kind of declared, aren't they? Yeah. Right, right. The NYPD yeah. wouldn't pull a U.S. national off the street in London without talking to Scotland Yard and MI5 first. Like mm. it would be a whole mm. thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the issue here. But to me, it just speaks of, it speaks to the sort of hyper aggressive term is wolf warrior diplomacy that uh, the Chinese have undertaken in the last couple of years, you know, which is really indicative mm. of of uh, Xi Jinping's rule 
in in China. Um, and after the party conference, he's not going anywhere anytime soon. So don't expect this no. to change. No, no. And there's, there's two other <laughs> stories involving Chinese intelligence we haven't even touched upon. Because um, just towards the end of October, U.S. Department of Justice announced charges against mm-hmm. two Chinese nationals who attempted to steal technology, silence distance, and attempted to obstruct an investigation into a major telecoms company with bribes in jewelry and cash. Um, and then you've also got another case in New Jersey where four people, three of which are alleged to be intelligence operatives of the Chinese government, have been charged with using a fake think tank to recruit former and active U.S. officials. And the goal was to procure technology and ship it back to China. And it does make you wonder what kind of technology they were trying to procure because, you know, um, it'd be interesting, like, yeah, what were they trying to get hold of? Because, you know, even if you do recruit a US official, they're not exactly going to walk in of anything they can't carry. So yeah. I don't know what kind of technology they're trying to ship back to China, but um, the Chinese intelligence have uh, their eyes on something that I have no idea exists. So there we go. Yeah. So it's been a bit of a funny month for Chinese intelligence in, in the US and then the worldwide. So yeah. I mean, I think as these as these mm. stories bubble up in the press, you know, either through DOJ indictments or, or you know, these tax issues that sort of flag these things we're, you're really just seeing the tip of the iceberg i mean the depth mm. and the scale of of operations being perpetrated by china's ministry of state security and pla's own intelligence organizations against not just the u.s but the west at large um has to be absolutely staggering and yeah what we're seeing here is just the very tip of the iceberg i mean as far as economic and industrial espionage that the chinese would be interested in you know there's no there's no limit to it you know like we've recently just sort of decimated their domestic semiconductor industry the biden administration signed an executive order which essentially says that any american citizen working for a chinese semiconductor manufacturer has to leave the country immediately and they all did which essentially puts puts the industry out of business um, at least for a time, you know, so I'm sure they're definitely rushing to sort of fill in that gap. And you know, it's sort of the same thing to your point with uh, these RAF pilots going in and and training Chinese fighter pilots. You know, I mean, yeah, the US and the UK both use the F-35 on a number of different platforms. Queen Elizabeth uh, aircraft carrier uses the F-35. But to me, that's just I don't know if it's if it's it's certainly espionage in spirit. If not to the letter of the law, you know, I mean, if you think in the 70s or the 80s, if, okay, let's say this, in the late 80s, there was an uh, an F-117 test pilot, right? Stealth fighter, brand new, not used in combat yet. If an F-117 test pilot, okay, retired from the Air Force and then moved to the Soviet Union, to Moscow, and started training Soviet pilots on these, is, yeah, this is how... Uh, the U.S. Air Force is running the F-117 program. That would be espionage, and I promise you that fighter, that retired fighter pilot, could never come home again. You know, so whether this is illegal to the letter of the law, uh, it, it certainly seems that way in in spirit. And it's well, the British government now trying to change the yeah. law. <laughs> <laughs> so it is. It will be soon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in pretty in, uh, brilliant British fashion, uh, caught our pants down and now trying to yeah. bodge our way yeah. through fixing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be a very uh, British government way of dealing yeah. with things. Um, so, <laughs> so there we go. Um, is there anything else in anything we talked about you'd like to add, uh, or should we move on to spy entertainment? Uh, we can jump into spy entertainment. Cool. I'll start off. I, I've got a personal spy entertainment bit of news. Um, so my film. This is very exciting. Yeah, yeah. My film, The Dry Cleaner, is going to be screening at the Horsham Film Festival in the United Kingdom on the 30th of November at the Everyman Cinema for one night only. And tickets are only ten pounds, and I will be there. Um, I'm not doing a Q and A, which so I won't be. So you have to look out for me, and I'll probably be propping up the bar afterwards. But um, yeah, uh, it'd be not. I, this will be the first time I've seen my own film on a big screen because the dry cleaner only screen in film festivals virtually because uh, it kind of came out um, during the pandemic. Uh, been online for a few years uh, on iTunes and stuff, so it'd be nice to see it in 4K on a big screen. So uh, yeah. it's going to be quite exciting. Yeah. Oh uh, well, congratulations! That's very cool and exciting. Thank you. Uh, I saw you shared the dry cleaner with me. It was a while ago. Oh yeah. Oh, um, yeah. 
Yeah. I saw it. Uh, yeah, so not on the big screen, but uh, it was um, an excellent little spy story there. Thank you. Um, and any listeners in the UK, in the area of Horsham, um, should certainly avail themselves of the opportunity and go see it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now, we've got some other interesting bits of spy entertainment. Uh, we've got the in the US, um, and shortly to follow in the UK, will be season two of Gary Oldman's epic spy show, Slow Horses, which is based on the novels by Mick Heron. Um, so, Matt, you, you, I know you've watched the whole first series. I've only seen the first two episodes, but um, I know you've seen the whole series. What did you think of Slow Horses? I liked it a lot. I think I watched it in essentially one sitting. Mm. It's a pretty short. It's on Apple TV Plus in the US. I'm not sure if that's a... And the UK. Okay. Pretty sure. I think I watched it in like a sitting mm. or two. Mm. Great spy story. I have not read Mick Heron's novels to my great shame. Me neither. So it was sort of a... Great. I'm not alone in that. <laughs> Um, Sorry, Mick. I should, Sorry. though. Sorry. I, I should, though. He's highly recommended. <laughs> I have a very big one of my own that I'm trying to to get through, which sort of slows me down yeah, in yeah. reading stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, great spy story. Uh, I'm so delighted when I see a spy story put on screen, either on TV or in theaters, that is, like, accurate mm. and, and, and somewhat true to mm. the profession, mm. you know, and it's not some rogue agent running from some all seeing all powerful service or it's you know just something ridiculous like that and this I wonder what is that show could be that. I feel it's, like I've seen that somewhere just recently I don't know <laughs> I think there's a few of them. Yeah. Oh god. Uh but yeah. there is one that that a new yeah. season of it just came out recently. I won't name it. Um sorry. Uh <laughs> but but yeah, yeah, uh it was it was a great it was a great spy story. Um awesome first season of the show. Can't wait for season two. Yeah. And in the US at least that comes out on December second, if not also in yeah. the UK. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, no, I'll yeah. be uh I, I, I I'm like probably a few people, I'm having to do periodic subscriptions with different services. So so um, Apple TV <laughs> is due for December because I've been meaning to watch Slow Horses, um, the first series, over Christmas. Um, that was my plan, and I'm trying to stick to that. So hopefully I'll get two seasons. And I think that there is now. Um, I I was very lucky to be a plus one at the Swanky premiere for uh, for uh, Slow Horses. Um, and I was chatting with somebody at Apple, whose name I can't remember because I had too much alcohol that evening. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I'm not protecting their identity. I just can't remember who they are. Sorry. But then apparently there are some other spy shows in the works too at Apple. Um, so there might be something coming up next year um, that should be quite interesting. So okay. They've had a few good spy shows on Apple TV. I think Tehran yeah, was on, is on yeah. Apple TV+. Plus. That's a good one. There's a remake of Le Bureau happening. And I don't know oh. if that's Apple or if that's somebody else. But I know there is a remake of Le Bureau, an American one in the works at the moment. Okay. I hope they. I hope they. I hope they do that well. The bureau was such a good show. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. It was everything that I wanted Homeland to be, mm. but, it, um, but Homeland didn't deliver for me personally. Uh, I loved the first series, but felt the. It was the moment that for me, <laughs> the moment where that show went downhill was when is it Rupert Friend stabbed Brody through the hand. That was literally the yes. moment where the show for me yeah. jumped the shark. Um. At, and got silly i never got that into homeland i watched the first season mm. um i think shortly after it aired and uh it was it was good but it's one of those situations where like it's 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 hard for me to watch stuff like that if i'm just constantly going to be like no that's not right that's wrong yeah that could be done better like you know that's not what that person does in that situation mm. um mm. It, mm. it's just it's hard for me to watch stuff like that you know, so the good thing about mm. slow horses is it wasn't like that. Yeah, no, no, yeah. no, it was, uh, no, it was not like that at all. Some good, nice sort of vivid characterization in there, and it's, uh, yeah, it was quite, um, no, it was quite a fun, fun show, and uh, so I look forward to watching that over Christmas. And then we've got spies in space, haven't we, with Andor? Spies in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> now, and you've been watching that. You've been enjoying that. Yeah. So this is uh, Andor, uh, which is one of the Star Wars series on Disney Plus. Um, yeah, it's it's still ongoing as of this recording. I think there's uh, what three or four episodes left of the yeah. first season. Um, and I think it's wonderful. I mean, definitely sort of categorizes as spy entertainment. It's about, um, 
the beginnings of the Rebel Alliance uh, before they sort of officially became the Rebel Alliance and like their nascent uh, insurgency against um, the Empire that's been in power for a few years at this point in the show. Um, yeah, and sort of shows like this beginnings of a Rebel Intelligence Network um, and, and how they operate against sort of the all-seeing eye of the Empire. Um, and it's it's very good. Uh, the showrunner is Tony Gilroy, who wrote the Jason Bourne movies, and he is as as far as writers go, working writers today. Tony mm. Gilroy is one of my mm. Um, mm. favorites, and to see him bring his talents to Star Wars um, is just wonderful yeah yeah i must be in the minority i quite enjoyed um the born film with jeremy renner to a point um that he directed and i can't remember what was that born no that born was the fourth one legacy wasn't it it's the fourth yeah, one yeah is that born legacy yeah is that what called I, it? I, I um, think so yeah the, yeah the one without Matt Damon. Right. And I quite enjoyed that film to a point. But I mean, it was a bit long in places and, and it ended with a motorbike chase that to me was just a bit, you know, a bit in the Bourne films, motorbike chase is a bit uh, ten a penny. So. Yes. <laughs> Especially by that point, because James Bond had done a few as well. So it's like, oh, not another motorbike. Can't they think of other transport options here? Yeah. But uh, <laughs> that was my only prison work. I, um, and or I've not watched myself properly. My wife's a huge fan of it because she's... Um, so saying to Matt, um, before we start... <laughs> I'm, I'm more of a Star Trek person um, than a Star Wars person uh, and and um, have been thoroughly enjoying Strange New World. But um, we should, as, as your suggestion, well, um, why don't we both watch Andor and compare notes next month? And yeah, I love yeah, that yeah. what I have noted is the music. The music's fantastic. Nicholas Patel. Really enjoy the score. Yeah, yeah he's great. So good. Same guy who does uh, Succession. Um, oh, is it? I love Succession too. God, composer. that's another great show. And that's due yeah. out next year, isn't it? So yeah, I can't wait for that. That'd be the will that be the final season? I think. I uh, I don't know if they said it. It if there it may be the se- if it, if it's not the final season, I think it would be the second to last. I think they are. They've said that they are coming up on the end. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, Matt, is it anything else you'd like to add? But I think I think we're kind of there. Aren't no, we? I think we covered it. Yeah. Until until next month. Yeah, we managed to get through October, which is a crazy month for. <laughs> espionage and we've only yes. we've only scratched the surface um in the show notes i'll post the links of what we did talk about and also post the links of what we didn't talk about because there's some interesting ones there um there is a new book coming out about rush uh, about chinese intelligence spies and lies and how china's covert operations fooled the world by alex Josky. Uh, so that's come out. Um, that's There's an article that we didn't discuss, but there's an article from Spy Talk all about that by Matt Brazil. And I'll be getting a copy of that book and I'm hoping uh, to maybe interview the author next year. Because um, nice. I've I, um, just on a quick personal note, whether it's relevant or not, but listeners, I've been taking a bit of a back step from um, interviewing authors about books lately just because I've read so many books over the last six years. I'm kind of a bit booked out right now. Some more recent interviews have been around uh, articles that are a little bit easier to prepare you know it's 10 hours versus two hours of prep so it's like um so uh yeah so it's so i hope people haven't um felt there's a quality difference but i it certainly made the podcast a little bit more enjoyable for me doing it that way um so i think going forward in the new year I won't do as many uh, book-based interviews as I have done in the past just because um, my poor dyslexic brain can't take it anymore. So there we go. go. But uh, yeah. Chris, when does this book come out? Is it out already or is it coming out? It's out now. Oh, it is? It's out the 12th. Yeah, so you can get it on Kindle and paperback. So uh, Great. Yeah, and it's not it's not expensive actually. It's only six pounds and two p on on Kindle. So uh, anyway, Matt, thank you so much for joining me, and uh, you, it's Chris. been wonderful to catch up with you. And I look forward to our next episode in December, which will be so between now and December. You've got Thanksgiving coming up. We've just had Halloween. Uh, how was your Halloween? <laughs> was it good? Uneventful. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. I had some kids come over. We did some trick or treating. I gave a lot of uh, sweets out to children and wished a lot of children happy Halloween, which made my wife laugh. Nice. Because uh, I didn't know what else to say <laughs> to children who want sweets. <laughs> I was like, happy Halloween, happy, happy Halloween. So that's what I was doing. Um, what are your plans for Thanksgiving? Got anything nice happening? You know, I don't I don't know yet. Usually I, I'm at either my cousin's house, who is a trained yeah. chef, and that's nice, or I'm at Ooh, my cool. aunt and uncle's house. Um I don't know yet. I don't know what our plans. Are. I should probably ask. Like, where where are we going? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's always yeah. a fun day, though. Any any food favorites for Thanksgiving? 
Uh, I love pumpkin pie. Um, I, if if you haven't had it, I go f- go find it somewhere. Oh, I've had pumpkin pie. Your, I made yeah. it uh, with my yeah sister in law last yeah, year, and uh, yeah. I particularly like squirting um, whipped cream on it, yeah. much to most people's disgust. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, no, I like I like all satisfying. the I like I like all the Thanksgiving <laughs> stuff. Excellent. Excellent. It's like a pre. Is it like a precursor to Christmas almost? Isn't there really a bit? So I my sort. So when I was a kid, in the morning mm. we would watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Parade down Broadway in New York. Like we watched it on TV. We didn't actually go. Uh, and sort of the tradition was it's not it's not officially Christmas until Santa comes at the end of the Macy's uh, Parade. And that was like the official cool. start of. Yeah. But, Nowadays, I mean, I was in a I was in a store over here uh, a couple of days ago. It was before Halloween, and they had Christmas mm-hmm. stuff up in the store, and I almost oh, had yeah, a stroke. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's just you know, it's <laughs> it's already started. Yesterday is a first world problem. I went to Starbucks hoping to get a pumpkin spice latte, only to be told that they don't do that anymore. They only do the Christmas drinks now, and I was like, oh no! And really? I, I generally don't drink. Yeah, so I never drink a, an eggnog latte, which is my Christmas drink, until December because I now drink it in honor of a friend of mine who passed away who loved christmas and loved uh starbucks christmas drinks i always wait till the 9th of december now um which was his birthday and uh yeah so i was just like oh no no more pumpkin spice latte i only had one this year mm. i really missed the boat on that one. Mm. Oh well next year <laughs> uh, next year <laughs> I will work hard on that next year. But there we go. So, um, everybody listening uh, uh, in advance, happy Thanksgiving because that's coming up. And our next episode will be December, and that'll be our, I guess, our last um, espresso martini of the year. Um, so, we'll be keeping an eye out for interesting spy stories for November. And um, I guess we might uh, speculate on what might happen over December, and then, um, and then we'll, re- I guess, we'll uh, resume this in January, uh, and then review. I, I guess. January January should probably be a review of the previous year, but we might be there all day. But anyway, <laughs> we'll do that. We'll see how it it's goes. A lot happened this it, year. Yeah, yeah, an awful lot has happened, and and um, oh god, if if what I've been reading is true, an awful lot might happen next year too. <laughs> so it's yes, like, could be an so, interesting uh, winter we, for you guys. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> already it's funny actually we we have changed our habits in the house a bit of energy now so we're much more energy efficient than we were Good. um and i and i, I bought a lot well i've always wear lots of layers anyway because our flats we got, we bought these we made a mistake of buying these heaters that look good but not very efficient so we barely use them they're not very good anyway so i, I was had a very cold winter last year so i'm kind of ready for this one so <laughs> wish you luck thank you anyway thanks matt look after yourself sure. and uh, i'll catch you on the next one Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies.